the public school system of this country is a far cry from what it once was. We've looked at the New England Primer. We pointed out the fact that the Bible was the premier textbook of the nation from the very beginning. We've looked at uh, McGuffey's Readers. I've been taking you through the Blueback Speller, and I, I, don't, I hate to rush through this too quickly because the extent to which morality, Christianity, is taught in this book is overwhelming. So let me treat you to some more of this. We're up to page uh, 40. The man who drinks rum may soon want a loaf of bread. Can you imagine teaching children that in school? The preacher is to preach the gospel taught in the public school. Blasphemy is contemptuous treatment of God. Larceny is theft, liable to be punished. Felony is a crime that may be punished with death. Capital punishment standard in this country for 150 years. History is an account of past events. A great part of history is an account of men's crimes and wickedness. If you have read your Bible carefully from Genesis to Revelation, that's a summary of the Bible. A bribe is given to corrupt the judgment. We have heard the chime of church bells. Did you hear about this city up in greater Chicago where the Muslim population is sounding out the prayer call five times a day? The community rose up and said, wait a minute, you can't do that. They went to court and said, hey, if you can ring your church bells, we can have our, our uh, prayer call. And uh, the city council said, they're right. And so it is so done. That idle boy is a very lazy fellow. We do not like to see our own sins. A vain girl is fond of fine things. God made the ear and he can hear. The good boy will not tear his book. Vain persons are fond of the allurements of dress. Strong drink leads to the debasement both of the mind and the body. We look with amazement on the evils of strong drink. And listen to this. The gambler wishes to get money without earning it. But a lottery is okay. The wicked know not the enjoyment of a good conscience. Parents should provide useful employment for their children. Men devoted to mere amusement misemploy their time. Washington was not a selfish man. He labored for the good of his country more than for himself. Is that a biblical principle, concept? Unselfishness, serving your fellow man? We punish bad men to prevent crimes. You know what conventional wisdom today is about uh, prison and, and uh, incarceration? Won't do any good. It's not an, a deterrent. That's a new thought. That's not the thought of America prior to our day. We pity the slavish drinkers of rum. The drunkard's face will publish his vice and his disgrace. On and on about alcohol and the evils of alcohol. Doesn't our country need that? There is a near intimacy between drunkenness, poverty, and ruin. The obstinate will soon be subdued. A witness must give true testimony. Worldly men make it their primary object to please themselves. It is customary for tipplers to visit taverns. The devil is the great adversary of man. Our actions are voluntary, proceeding from free will. That's a lost cultural value. Nowadays the attitude is, oh, it's not my fault. You know, it's my genes, my parents, the way they raised me, it's society. No. You're responsible for your own actions. They are voluntary. They proceed from your will. You make your decisions and you will stand for your actions. A church is called a sanctuary or holy place. The soul is immortal, it will never die. Our bodies are mortal, they will soon die. Paternal care and maternal love are great blessings to children, should be repaid with their duty and affection. All of this was taught to young people. A juror is one who sits to try causes and give a verdict according to the evidence. That's a new thought in our judicial system. Labor makes us strong and healthy. The work ethic taught constantly, not taught today. A pastor does not like to see vacant seats in his church. A vagrant is a wandering, lazy fellow. We don't have vagrants today. We have street people and it's not their fault. And so the word bum, hobo, vagrant, out of the American vocabulary. God has made two great lights for our world, the sun and the moon. A witness must tell all the truth in court. We're apt to live forgetful of our continual dependence on the will of God. We should not trust our lives to unskillful doctors or drunken sailors. <laughs> 
Rum, gin, brandy, and whiskey are destructive enemies to mankind. They destroy more lives than wars, famines, and pestilence. The drunkard's course is progressive. It begins by drinking a little and shortens his life by drinking to excess. Children should answer questions politely. Many persons spend too much time at taverns. God governs the world in infinite wisdom. The Bible teaches us that it is our duty to worship Him. It is a solemn thing to die and appear before God. All mankind have their origin from Adam. That goes against all evolutionary teaching. Goliath was the champion of the Philistines. Abraham was the great ancestor of the Hebrews. Good children will submit to the will of their parents. Idle children neglect their books when young and, then re and thus reject their advantages. Children should respect and obey their parents. Parents protect and instruct their children. Satan afflicted Job with sore boils. Teachers should try to implant good ideas in the minds of their pupils. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Proverbs 1.10. Children may be helpful to their parents. The chewing of tobacco is a useless habit. <laughs> Judas was a traitor. He betrayed his master. We should be attentive and helpful to strangers. Intemperance is a grievous sin of our country. Parents deserve the kind treatment of children. The rainbow is a token that the world will not be drowned again. Pay the laborer's wages when he has done his work. Prayer is a duty. Confess your sins and forsake them. Proverbs 23.10. Paul addressed Felix upon the subject of a future judgment. We detest robbers and pirates. The wicked transgress the laws of God. Never retaliate an injury, even on an enemy. Never equivocate or prevaricate, but tell the plain truth. Liquors that intoxicate are to be avoided as poison. You must not try to deceive your parents. Before you rise in the morning or retire at night, give thanks to God for his mercies and implore the continuance of his protection. Laws of nature sustained by the immediate presence and agency of God. The heavens declare an almighty power. This just goes on and on and on. How can a young man cleanse his way? Oh, how love I thy law, Psalm 119. No pleasure is equal to that of quiet conscience. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, Matthew 6, 20. A miraculous event. Consistency of character. Humility, the prime ornament of a Christian. A living of... Trifling amusements is derogatory to the Christian character. Look how offensive these constant references to Christianity would be to people who do not embrace Christianity. Did that stop them from including that in the public school textbook? Of course not. We cannot live our lives based on what everyone else around us thinks or believes or does, and yet that's kind of the prevailing attitude of the judges. Supreme Court is now saying, you know, we've got to make some of these decisions about abortion and homosexuality based on the world community, what their views are. For example, they're talking about the death penalty and how young a person should be, uh, how young can a person be before the death penalty is invoked. And the, the Supreme Court justices, the ones that are liberal, are saying, well, you know, we need to take into account the consensus of the world community. Founding fathers would have croaked on that. They didn't come to this new land and do, do what they did to copy the rest of the world. They knew that most of the world was, dis, was wicked. So they said, we need to start a republic based on Christian morality and forget the world. And now our own people are trying to emulate the world. Strong liquors inflame the blood and produce diseases. The prudent good man will govern his passions. God is the divine legislator. He proclaimed his Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. It's the duty of every good man to inspect the moral conduct of the man who is offered as a legislator at our yearly elections. What? What credentials, what qualifications do you look at before you elect a politician? Their morality. If the people wish for good laws, they may have them by electing good men. The legislative councils of the United States should feel their dependence on the will of a free and virtuous people. Our farmers, mechanics, and merchants compose the strength of our nation. Let them be wise and virtuous and watchful of their liberties. Let them trust no man to legislate for them. If he lives in the habitual violation of the laws of his country, how many lawbreakers do we have that are in politics? 
And they say, oh, well, then my personal life doesn't have anything to do with that. Founding fathers didn't believe that. No one his family outlived all the people who lived before the flood. Is that a fact? Time will come when we must bid a last farewell to this world. God will forgive those who repent of their sins and live a holy life. Thy testimonies, are, O Lord, are very sure. That's Psalm 93. Don't attempt to deceive God, nor to mock Him with solemn words while your heart is set to do evil. A holy life will disarm death of its sting. God will impart grace to the humble penitent. Abusive words irritate the passions, but a soft answer turns away wrath. Proverbs 15, a section on idolatry. Do nothing that is injurious to religion, to morals, or to the interest of others. Listen to this, folks. What's the number one reason given in courts for divorce today? Incompatibility. It was once a practice in France to divorce husband and wife for incompatibility of tempers. Just couldn't get along. A practice soon found to be incompatible with social order. Does the Bible teach that? Absolutely. Is America in the throes of experiencing disorder? Absolutely. If we'd been teaching our young people all through the last 50 years that fact, maybe we would be in better shape. We cannot doubt the incomprehensibility of the divine attributes. The heathen are those people who worship idols or who know not the true God. Those who enjoy the light of the gospel and neglect to observe its precepts are more criminal than the heathen. All mankind are brethren, descendants of common parents. Bad boys sometimes know what a whip is by their feelings. This is a kind of knowledge which good boys dispense with. <laughs> the love of whiskey has brought many a strong fellow to a disgraceful death. Take away your exactions from my people, Ezekiel 14, verse 9. On and on. Examine the scriptures daily and carefully and set an example of good works. Number of references to Christ. The Bible, that is the Old and New Testament, contains the Holy Scriptures. Whatever is wrong is a deviation from right or from the just laws of God or man. How happy men would be if they would always love what is right and hate what is wrong. A reference to Romans. Then at the very end, you have a number of uh, little fables. Look at this one. Fable 1 of the boy that stole apples. An old man found a rude boy upon one of his trees stealing apples and desired him to come down. But the young sauce box told him plainly he would not. Won't you, said the old man, then I will fetch you down. So he pulled up some turf or grass and threw at him. But this only made the youngster laugh to think the old man should pretend to beat him down from the tree with grass only. Well, well, said the old man. If neither words nor grass will do, I must try what virtue there is in stones. So the old man pelted him heartily with stones, which soon made the young chap hasten down from the tree and beg the old man's pardon. Moral, if good words and gentle means will not reclaim the wicked, they must be dealt with in a more severe manner. That used to be part and parcel of our judicial system and of parenting. It is neither. Now, what about our universities? I can stand here without fear of any successful contradiction. They're gone. They're gone. They are the centers of political correctness, the centers of Marxist, socialist, atheistic, humanistic, pluralistic teaching. The very opposite of what they were all founded to be. If you don't believe that, pick out a university, go back and look at the original chart. Let me show you one. In the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there is a reference to the university at Cambridge and the encouragement of literature. Which university would that be? Harvard. Whereas our wise and pious ancestors so early as the year 1636 laid the foundation of Harvard College, named after John Harvard, 
in which university many persons of great eminence have by the blessing of God been initiated in those arts and sciences which qualified them for public employments both in church and state. And whereas the encouragement of arts and sciences and all good literature tends to the honor of God, the advantage of the Christian religion, and the great benefit of this and the other United States of America. Why was Harvard started? What is the purpose of public education? To promote the knowledge of God and Christianity. You check Yale, Princeton, check all of them. That's why they were founded. University system of this country, I'm telling you, is gone. We conclude, from the very beginning of the nation up to the 1950s, American public schools were Bible-oriented. They immersed children. They saturated the spirits of our young with the morals and the teachings and the doctrines of Christianity. What a change. You aware of the fact that we have some national hymns and songs? Of course you are. You've heard these. How about God of Our Fathers, written in 1876, adopted as the hymn for the centennial, 100-year celebration of the Constitution. Uh, the point, my point being, references to the God of our fathers. The God of the Bible is the God that directed and blessed the forefathers of this country. That's the point of the song. What about our national anthem? Written by Francis Scott Key, 1814, right back very near the beginning. This is sung at baseball games and many other times and places, isn't it? Did you know there are four verses? Look at the fourth verse. Francis Scott Key. Oh, thus be it ever when freedmen shall stand between their loved home and the war's desolation, blessed with victory and peace. May the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must, when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. That shouldn't be our national anthem. That violates the Constitution. How about My Country Tis of Thee, the actual title America, written by Samuel Smith, 1832. This is in our hymn books. Our Father's God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. Battle Hymn of the Republic, written during the Civil War by Julia Ward Howe. It is basically a war song based upon the Bible and the appropriateness of war in the name of true moral principles. You're familiar with our God is marching on, but look how much more specific this song gets with regard to Christianity, not a generic concept of deity. For example, we have a reference to the gospel itself and to the hero born of woman, may he crush the serpent with his heel. Who's that referred to? Genesis 3.15, Jesus Christ. As he died to make men holy. Unmistakable reference to the crucifixion. I'm telling you, Christianity is thoroughly embedded in our national institutions. America the Beautiful, Catherine Lee Bates, God shed his grace on thee. America, America, God has shed his grace on you. That's why you have enjoyed what you've enjoyed all these years. We're going to lose it. What about Irving Berlin's God Bless America? I actually wrote it in 1918. It was really kind of a vaudeville song. It didn't go over well. So he dropped it for about 20 years, pulled it out, brushed it off, re, kind of rewrote it, refurbished it, re-released it in 1938. Any of you old enough to remember who uh, introduced it on radio nationwide to the American population, Kate Smith, November 11, 1938, during the Depression. 
belted that out with her robust voice. God bless America. You can't say that now. You can't have it in, public, in the public sector. And then have you thought about the fact that all over our country, our counties, our cities, our towns, and many other geographical locations have been named... Where have these names come from? Well, a lot of sources. Maybe a geographical location from Europe, like York, England. Well, we'll call this New York. Hampshire, England, we'll call this New Hampshire. A lot of that. A lot of uh, names that are traced to foreign languages. A lot of Spanish names. A lot of American Indian names, right? San Marcos, San Antonio, Spanish names. Uh, a lot of unique features of the terrain. You know, maybe a flat bottom Kentucky and things like that, where they just picked out a a uh, curious uh, geographical feature. War heroes, Pulaski, Tennessee, named after a Polish war general. Other honorees. But you know what? All over this country, a lot of the names have come from the Bible. So much so that I'm sure many, perhaps most Americans, are not even aware of it. I've only begun to tap into this feature. And I've about decided there's no end to it. There are towns with the word gospel. There are Bethlehems all over the country. Nazareth, Trinity, Canaan, Damascus, Dothan and Grace, Alabama. Lots of Antiochs. There's a lot of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Sometimes with Saint appended. There's Timothy, Titus, Titusville, Saint James, Saint Peter, Saint Petersburg. Lots of Saint Paul and Saint Paul's. Lots of uh, Saint Joseph's. St. Elizabeth, Stephen, Stevens, lots of St. Mary and Marys. Mount Zion, people probably don't even know what that refers to from the Bible. There's Adam, Adamsburg, over two dozen Adamsvilles. There's Eve, Cain, Abel, Noah, Shem, Ham, Abraham, Lot, Sarah, Isaac, again Joseph, Job, Moses, Washington. Lots of Daniels, there's Obadiah, Saul, David, Uriah, Solomon, Samson. Lots of Sinai's and Mount Sinai's. Providence, Rhode Island, Edom, Texas, how would you like to live in Hell, Michigan, Paradise, Texas, Sodom, Maine, that's probably aptly named, Gomorrah, Massachusetts, all over the country. And what is the ACL going to, ACLU going to do about our cemeteries? Have you noticed at the side of the road a custom that I remember as a child back in the 50s? has been reinstated where an accident sites where people have lost their lives crosses are once again being erected you've been noticing that I'm amazed that hadn't been stopped or at least made politically correct by using other religious symbols as well so far that seems to be the unanimous approach here's the World War II monument that was recently unveiled I want to call your attention to the military cemeteries. I spotlight these because they are government connected. Are you aware of the fact that we have military cemeteries all over the world where our young people have fought on foreign soil? There are eight World War I U.S. cemeteries in Europe, mostly in France, Belgium, one in England. Here are their locations and the number of young people that have been interred at those locations. Let me show you how they all look. Here's the one in Ballou Woods, France, Brookwood, England, Werridge in Belgium, Meuse, France, another one from France, these are all World War I, another one in France, Boney, France, Surinez, France. Look in the chapel. They have this engraving. Grant unto them, O Lord, eternal rest who sleep in unknown graves. Those are all World War I. Every single one of them organized in the same fashion. There are 12 World War II cemeteries, again mostly in Europe, one in North Africa, one in the Philippines. Here are their locations and the number of dead that have been interred at those locations. We're talking thousands and thousands of young men. Here's the one in Belgium. Marsh, France. Cambridge, England. Epinal, France. Florence, Italy. Belgium. Another one in France. 
Luxembourg City in the country of Luxembourg. Notice in the chapel at the location, notice the symbol between the flags and the candles. Surprise that has not been eliminated. Here's the one in the Philippines. Here's one in the Netherlands. Here's the one in North Africa where Patton was so active, Tunisia. Here's another one in France. Nettuno, Italy. And here is the one overlooking the beach at Normandy, Omaha Beach, on the cliffs overlooking this site where literally thousands of young men lost their lives in a matter of minutes. Up on this cliff, hundreds interred, overlooking the English Channel. Do you know in every single one of these cemeteries, a white marble headstone marks the grave. Occasionally, you will find a Star of David for a Jewish soldier. But by and large, these cemeteries are dominated by the Christian symbol of the cross. Government purchased. What's the ACLU going to do about that? Arlington National Cemetery. This is our national cemetery. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, but it is the national cemetery. There are interments from every war because they've been taken and moved to this location even though the actual cemetery did not start until the Civil War based on land confiscated from Robert E. Lee and his family and estate. But uh, once again, many, many military markers. Notice the difference. These are not just outright blatant crosses, but look a little closer. Every single one of these headstones has engraved into the headstone a cross. And the cemetery itself, of course, is loaded with allusions to this. If you were to go to the government website, the National Cemetery, you would find on that website allusion to an Easter sunrise service that was held called Free and Non-Denominational, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the central tenet of the Christian faith. I couldn't believe when I saw this on the website that they've allowed that to stay. On that occasion, the uh, President's own played uh, at the service, the United States Marine Band. Folks, this could go on and on and on. Think of public life. For example, uh, the Pony Express. Remember that? For a very short period in our history prior to the arrival of the telegraph and then uh, other forms of communication that supplanted the Pony Express, but for a critical moment in our history, here was a way to get a letter to someone in a matter of 10 days that before would have taken months for the distance that was covered. The fellows that started this, and specifically uh, Alexander Majors, required every Pony Express rider to take an oath and to carry in his saddlebag a Bible that was engraved and given to the, uh, the employee uh, by the company. Look at the oath that they had to take. I do hereby swear before the great and living God that during my engagement, while I'm in an employee of uh, Russell Majors and Waddell, I will under no circumstances use profane language, drink no intoxicating liquors, not quarrel or fight with any other employee of the firm, and in every respect I'll conduct myself honestly, be faithful to my duties, and so direct all my acts as to win the confidence of my employers, so help me God. Do you understand that the very essence of human civilization if it does not have a sizable percentage of its citizenry oriented toward a fixed moral framework, then civilization will begin to unravel, decline, and ultimately collapse. This is what has held us together for 200 years. But it is quickly evaporating from our civilization. The outcome is inevitable. You don't have to be a prophet to predict what's going to happen. Did you know we have had a National Day of Prayer, NDP, going all the way back to the very beginning? Different individuals, presidents and others have handled this in different ways. Look at this one written, uh, a statement written by Ronald Reagan. Today prayer is still a powerful force in America. Our faith in God is a mighty source of strength. Our Pledge of Allegiance states that we're one nation under God. Our currency bears the motto, in God we trust. The morality and values such faith implies are deeply embedded in our national character. Our country embraces those principles by design, and we abandon them at our peril. 
Yet in recent years, well-meaning Americans in the name of freedom have taken freedom away. For the sake of religious tolerance, they have forbidden religious practice in the classrooms. The laws of this land have effectively removed prayer from our classrooms. Listen to these haunting questions. How can we hope to retain our freedom through the generations if we fail to teach our young that our liberty springs from an abiding faith in our Creator? What's the answer to that question? Can't. He sounded, by the way, like these founding fathers that I've introduced you to. Same sort of talk. On and on we could go. I'm telling you folks, the evidence is massive. How many of you are old enough to remember the blue laws? Young people are just, it boggles their mind to find out that there was a time in our history prior to 50 years ago when it was illegal for a business to be open on Sunday. Except hospitals, maybe pharmacies, things that were absolutely necessary to sustaining life. Otherwise, you could be taken, arrested and taken to court. And in fact, there are many court cases in the 1800s against those who violated the blue laws. And there's only one reason for those laws. They said this is a Christian country and on Sunday people are to worship God. I could add so much more to this, but I'm telling you this plethora of evidence that the Christian faith has been deeply embedded in American culture. That evidence is massive, it is expansive, it is decisive. The forces of political correctness do not want to face this. They want to keep it from the public and they want to deny it and try to twist it, but I believe I've given you enough to show you. You've seen it with your own eyes. It is a fact. This conspiracy, therefore, is in direct contradiction to everything that has preceded the last 50 years or so. Look again at this massive amount of evidence that I presented you, and as I said, there's so much more. So much more. Our civilization has literally been saturated. In fact, folks, please think about this. Christianity has been in existence for a mere 2,000 years. Will you please tell me where in the last 2,000 years on this planet Christianity has been so thoroughly part and parcel of a specific culture? This is unprecedented. It is unsurpassed. No country, no government, no civilization has been so thoroughly oriented toward God, the Bible, and Christianity. Do you think it's coincidental? Ask yourself this question in view of what you know about the Bible and how God has operated throughout human history. Do you think it's coincidental that when all of this came together for one brief, shining, incredible moment in the late 1700s, do you think it's coincidental that just shortly thereafter men began to say, Let's go back to pure New Testament Christianity. You think those two occurrences are just totally separated? No connection? Isn't it like the God of the universe to say, okay, here's a group of people, here's a group of men that have stepped right out in front of the world and said, it's one God, the Bible is his word, Christianity is the one true and only religion. The morality of New Testament Christianity is the only basis of a survivable government. That's what we're doing here. The God you read about in the Old Testament, isn't he the kind of God that would say, okay, I'll bless that. In fact, I will so bless you that you will experience a level of prosperity that is unsurpassed in all of human history. And then to provide an incubator for pure New Testament Christianity to suddenly spring forth. Where did New Testament Christianity begin? Palestine. Is it there today? Maybe not much. It is a spiritual 
barren wasteland. Where on the surface of this planet in the last 2,000 years, from the very beginning of Christianity, has New Testament Christianity burst forth, blossomed, flourished, prospered, and sent missions all over the world? I'm telling you it's because we have been in a country that has accommodated that. And God has allowed us to take advantage of it. And we're going to lose it all. You know, God will say, fine. If he doesn't send his son back to put an end to the whole thing, he'll just switch somewhere else. But I'm telling you, when you put it all together, this is unique. This is unique in all of human history. I believe Americans have done better than even the Israelites did when they first came out of Egypt and said, okay, you know, we'll follow God a little while here. Didn't last long. I believe America's done a better job than they did. This civilization has accomplished things in every area of human industry that you want to examine. Every aspect of human endeavor that, as I said, is unparalleled in human history. I don't believe that just is a quirk circumstance of history. Our founding fathers wanted a nation that had freedom, not freedom from religion, which is what we're being told, but freedom for religion, and they meant the Christian religion and no other. Let me begin in this session and in our final session, trying to answer the question, so what? All right, you've convinced us, yes, we had a Christian orientation, but that's not America today. We've changed, and therefore we're going to change all the laws. We need to just revolutionize our country and orient it more toward uh, a religionless society. That's what they're trying to do. What would God have us to do? Well, in poring over the Bible and trying to think through this, I've come up with a few very concrete suggestions that I think are biblical and within our reach. Number one, I would suggest to you that you and I, as American citizens, have been adversely influenced by the last 50 years. We have. we softened. Haven't you been shocked at some of what I've showed you? That the average American at one time knew their Bible better than we do? Shame on us. So you and I are going to have to stop allowing our cultural environment and the atmosphere that's been created in the last 50 years from influencing us. We need to shake ourselves out of this lethargy, go back and reacquaint ourselves with true spirituality. So we're going to have to start with ourselves. We need to rededicate ourselves to being serious about this. See, that's hard to do because we have achieved a comfort level, again, unprecedented in human history. Americans have it so good. It, it, it is so... It is so thorough and extensive that when foreigners come to this country, it almost ruins them. They can't handle the prosperity. And we're like, you know, what's your problem? We take money and throw it around over in foreign countries and, and we ruin people because they just, they can't handle it. They don't, they don't understand what it's like to be this wealthy. We've become so accustomed to it that we pretty much demand it, expect it, and don't don't put me out any, don't, you know, okay, I, I'm concerned about our country, but I'm busy. You know, I'm playing my grandkids, and I've got, you know, retirement or jobs, and, you know, just a lot of things that are taking up my time. I can't do anything about this. Okay. Don't be surprised what happens. You know, every civilization that finally experiences some catastrophic alteration, look back at history, a lot of them have done it. In fact, God usually uses an aggressor nation to punish a nation more righteous than the aggressor. That's God. Read Habakkuk. And so when this uh, evil force comes and starts punishing people, suddenly, guess what? They got time. Now we've got time to do something about this. But guess what? It's too late. It's too late. 
Do you think that uh, those Islamic terrorists who were willing to fly four airplanes and kill 3,000 people like that, do you think if they had access to a nuclear device that they would hesitate for a second to use it? Then you see we're not talking about 3,000. They set one of those off in New York, we're talking about 8 million. You think that could happen? You think with all of our tremendous military and all of the security, everything we're doing, man, we can, we can stop that from happening. No, we can't. Because such actions have never been ultimately dependent upon your own ability to protect yourself. The Bible's very clear about this. You have to be right with God, and then He will protect you. If you're not right with God, nothing you can do. They're going to get you sooner or later. They're going to get you. If we of all people on the face of this planet do not get serious about being mature, dedicated, disciplined, spiritual people, then the rest of our society doesn't have a ghost of a chance. It's got to start with us and our families. We need to demand that our families straighten up or basically get out because this is of eternal consequence. We are in a critical moment in history. And we need to be decisive and determined. That means then we need to make certain that our children are going to follow our cultural, moral, spiritual values. Remember what God said about Abraham? I know Abraham. He'll command his family and they will do what he tells him to do on spiritual matters. I never thought I would say, you know, maybe we need to just drop the public school system. Just bail out. A lot of Americans are. Lots of them. That too is unprecedented in American history. But I'm at the point of saying it. I'm telling you the average public school system in this country, even one where our, our children attended, which was very conservative, they are being fed sinister, evil things on a daily basis that you don't even know is going on. And if you do, who knows whether you're counteracting it. That may seem drastic, but yeah, <laughs> I'm advising parents, get your kids away from those people. They are some of the most liberal, sinister, wicked idealists on the planet. It all started in the 60s. I remember the change, the shift in the public school. It's gone to seed now. And don't you know that they are angry that so many Americans are dropping out? They've done everything they can through the courts to try to stop it. So far, Americans are being allowed to do it. We'd better save our families. In a sense, you could turn the, the, the country around with one generation. But we're going to have to be diligent about that generation. Number three, how much prayer we've been doing on this thing? Well, in our public services, in our three prayers, a song, and the sermon, we'll mention, you know, God, please help our country. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about prayer. How many of you have ever had something tragic happen in your life? Maybe the death of a loved one. Do you remember how your schedule suddenly changed? You thought, you know, I've got to do this this week, this this week. I can't take off work. I've got this. But suddenly when something like that happened, you took off work. And I mean, your life came to a screeching halt. And for two or three days, you went through a mourning process. You just did. I believe we're at that point. I don't think a little prayer that here and there is going to do it. I think, for example, that 1.2 million members of the Church of Christ are going to have to get down on their knees and look up to the God of the universe and say, man, we are in big trouble. We desperately need your help. Help us deal with this situation. Do what can be done providentially. Help us to know what we need to do to do this. When was the last time the elders of, of churches all over this country told the membership, all right, we want the whole membership to be here Thursday night. We're going to spend two hours in solid prayer. No announcements, no songs. We're going to pray to God and beg Him. We are under a state of national emergency. The God you read about in the Bible, would He do anything about that? Would He give any sort of response? 
Would he listen to his people pleading and crying out to him day and night? Oh yeah, the God of the Bible would do something about that. You know what? We're not doing that. Like I said, we're too busy, we're comfortable, have all we want to eat, nice cars, nice homes. Oh, it's sad what's happening out here, but it hadn't affected me really that much yet. I'm, I'm living good. It's going to be too late. You know, the Founding Fathers made a statement along that line. They said, when people become comfortable with material prosperity and no longer appreciate the freedom and the circumstances that brought them to that condition, you know what? They deserve neither. These men were willing to put their lives on the line. Many of them were economically devastated because of the time they devoted to public service. They were willing to sacrifice and do that. We're not. For an even higher calling. But the Bible's clear. We'd better get serious about supplications, prayers, intercessions. They need to be frequent, constant. We need to do it individually. We need to do it collectively. It needs to be sustained. It needs to manifest perseverance. I believe churches should rally and get busy. What about political participation? No, no, Dave. Uh, stat of politics now. Religion and politics don't mix. <laughs> After seeing what I've showed you about what the Founding Fathers said, what would they say if you said that to them? They would laugh in your face. What do you mean politics and religion are separate? Politics must be rooted in religion. Satan is slick. He says, man, I'll just get all of the key issues of society that are going to affect whether a country can even stand. And I'll just shift them over into the political atmosphere, political arena, and call them political, and then, then they're free, and I can, man, I can have a heyday. That's what he's done. The key moral issues of our day, and that's what I'm really leading up to here. What does all this come down to? It comes down to the moral issues that will cause God to destroy this country. The two premier issues are abortion and homosexuality. God's not going to put up with that. Not indefinitely, he will not. I realize that our voting, we think, doesn't matter, but it does. History show that it does. The polls show that it does. Most Americans don't vo vote, and so the few militant get their way. There have been people put into office that just horrified. How did they ever get in there? Because the few that wanted them went and voted, nobody else did. That's been proven. We need to contact people. Edmund Burke said, you know, for evil to triumph, just don't do anything. It will. And it is triumphing in our society. You remember what Jesus said in the parable of the sower? While men slept. That's how the tares got sown in amongst the wheat. We did nothing. What is James Garfield known for, besides being president of the United States? We claim he was a member of the Church of Christ. Late 1800s, listen to what he said at the centennial. Now more than ever before, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it is because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it is because the people demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislature. If the next centennial does not find us a great nation, it will be because those who represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation do not aid in controlling the political forces. That's prophetic. Here is the first Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, appointed to the court by George Washington. John Jay. Oh, we need more men like him today. He was asked the question, should Americans elect non-Christians to public office? Here's his answer. Whether our religion permits Christians to vote for infidel rulers is a question which merits more consideration than it seems to have generally received either from the clergy or the laity. It appears to me that what the prophet said to Jehoshaphat about his attachment to Ahab affords a salutary lesson. You know what <laughs> Jehoshaphat said? Shouldst thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Probably the group of people in our nation that hate the Lord the most now is the Hollywood crowd. And yet we empower them. We buy their stuff right and left, go to their movies. 
We help the ungodly and love those who hate the Lord. Shame, shame. He also said, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. That's a profound statement. Most nations in human history have not been given that opportunity. They were either ruled by a genetic king, a dictator. It's rare to have a nation that decides who their leaders are going to be. He says, God gave us that situation. It's the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christian. The first chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. He thought it was a Christian nation in its overall orientation. Noah Webster, let it be impressed on your mind that God commands you to choose for rulers just men who will rule in the fear of God. If the citizens neglect their duty and place unprincipled men in office, the government will soon be corrupted. If our government fails to secure public prosperity and happiness, it must be because the citizens neglect the divine commands themselves and elect bad men to make it administer the laws. Exodus 18, 21. Powerful passage. Look at it. Here's the kind of people that should be selected for political office. Number one, able men. They are capable, talented people. Two, they fear God. Number three, they tell the truth. They're not deceitful, dishonest, conniving. And number four, they hate covetousness. Why would that be a qualification for a politician? How many times has our political forces, political authorities voted themselves pay increases? Exempted themselves from all of the restrictions we have? We've got a bunch of greedy people that are in control. We deserve the response, the result. Proverbs 29, when righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When a wicked man rules, the people groan. The king establishes the land by justice, but you receive bribes, you're going to overthrow the country. Is that going on in our country? All over the place. I believe we need to get involved politically, folks, because when God said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that did not exempt the politicians. <laughs> they need to be preached to, too. I think we ought to investigate these people. There are voter guides that tell us about it. In fact, just pick up the phone and call them. This can be done in 10 minutes or less. Ask them three questions. What, should, what do you think is the relationship between God and government, religion in our country? Oh, I, I think, you know, this is a free country. You can believe what you want, religion. We ought to keep that out of the government. Okay, you got your answer. Number two, what is your view about killing unborn babies? You know, they, when they open their mouth, even if they want to tap dance and avoid the issue, you're going to find out where they stand pretty quick. Number three, what's your view of same-sex marriage? Folks, you shouldn't go any further. I don't care what they feel about the economy and health care and everything else. In fact, the three forces in our civilization right now that are wreaking havoc on our Christian heritage have come out boldly, strongly, in no uncertain terms on these two critical, foundational, moral issues. I'm telling you, we had better get busy and recognize the seriousness of these two issues for the future of our nation. If we do not, all the things that we thought were equally important are suddenly going to be seen in the light of eternity to be Nothing. And we are going to find that God was outraged that these two behaviors have become rampant in our land. In our next session together, I want to call your attention in a small way to the extent to which our civilization is being restructured to accommodate the morality of the most wicked philosophies in human history.